first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, this is repository cohorts, uh, how OSPOS can programmatically categorize all of the repositories. Uh, this talk to get, has been put together by, uh, I'll start myself, James Siri, uh, my teammate Justin Gosses, who isn't here today, and then I'll let everyone else introduce themselves. Hi there, uh, my name is Remy DeCosmaker. I'm the open source lead at the digital service at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Ooh. Hi, I'm uh, Isaac Malarski. I'm a US Digital Core Fellow working with Remy at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Hi, I'm Natalia. I'm a US Digital Core Fellow too under the software engineering track and I'm also part of the CMS OSPO. Yeah, I got this one. Okay. Oh. Uh, all right, so let's begin. Mm, if it will let me. Oh no, it's trying to type now. There we go. Okay, so in this pre presentation, we're gonna explain the concepts behind repository cohorts, uh, but we've also released some code demos. Uh, there are links here. Don't worry if you don't catch them now, you're gonna get them again later. Uh, they're here so you can start playing with them. Uh, they'll be, prov uh, I already said they're gonna be provided. Uh, we won't be going through them in depth though, uh, but if you want to explore repository cohorts and their GitHub or for your own GitHub organizations, this is a great place to start. So. What exactly are repository cohorts? They're concepts uh, of programmatic manipulation of raw repository metadata into higher abstract forms. Uh, they allow us to quickly understand the defining characteristics of a repository, its community, and its underlying usage. Uh, repository cohorts are easily customizable to fit your needs and are repeatable across organizations with minimal additional investment. So, what's a formal definition of that? Uh, they're reusable standardized programmatic labels that you apply to your repositories based on programs, uh, you, which we've provided. Uh, OSPOS can treat them, uh, these based on um, important characteristics rather than treating every repository as a median repository. So it, it actually allows you to repeat the process over and over again. In practice, uh, for each repository, we can store a cohort value as either true or false. Many of the cohorts are in groups that cover some range of dimensions. For example, we can define the age of a cohort based on the number of days since a repository was created or made public. Uh, others can be singular statements of fact, like does this repository use GitHub Actions or not? But when all the dimensions of a cohort are defined, we have a data-driven approach to understanding who, when, how, uh, and how our repositories are being used so we can make decisions that fit the entire range of offerings. So what problems do repository cohorts solve? OSPOs have hundreds or even tens of thousands of repositories under their control, which makes it hard to understand the particular needs and circumstances of each individual, individual community and of the, every repository you own. People don't have time or patience to read every readme or look at issues and pull requests to understand each individual community or how a repository is actually being used out in the wild. As a result, all repositories get treated the same. A single set of rules, a single set of guidance, a single set of best practices to follow. This becomes less than ideal when your repositories are actively being developed by teams of 20 and have a user base of thousands, while other repositories are intended to be more static examples of an implementation used in, say, a paper or a, targeting a specific audience. Raw repository metadata uh, analysis also takes a huge amount of time and is incredibly uh, manually like time-consuming. Uh, so these are three examples of the different use cases of why you would want to not look at the raw metadata, um, but they all clearly demonstrate that creating policy or guidance that accommodates the various needs becomes increasingly difficult as your repository types differ and diverge. So, how can repository cohorts help? First, repository cohort, with repository cohorts, we're trying to gain an ability to describe important characteristics of repositories with metadata such that we can work with a number of repositories too great to individually analyze. OSPOs with a large, number, uh, a large open source presence can have repositories numbering in the tens of thousands as stated before, but even a few hundred are often too great to be reliably and repeatedly processed. A metadata-driven meta approach solves for this and allows OSPOs to function at whatever scale they need. Second, there's a tendency to write queries that work with raw metadata directly. This is totally fine. But it also provides an easy path for projects to be analyzed with differing metrics bounds, which can be, create confusion and uncertainty over time. Uh, it also means that writing a lot of these queries from scratch increases the time and cognitive load every time you want to change something. Uh, when using repository cohorts, we're using queries defined in code that is generalizable and repeatable, meaning it can be used from project to project or organization to organization without any additional time investment. Uh, lastly, 
we can only reason about one, maybe two large scale groups of repo metadata at a time in our own heads. With repository cohorts, we'll be making higher order representations, which make it easier to think through that data, um, which will be made more apparent as we look into a sample, which, here's some samples. For the most part, we're basing our cohort labels on Nadia labels. We're gonna cover that a little bit more in, uh, later in this presentation. Uh, we define uh, our age cohort as baby, toddler, teen, adult, and senior based on the number of days since a rep repository was actually created. Uh, we also have activity cohorts, which are based on how active is the repo. So when was the last time a repo was updated? Uh, that isn't specifically dependent on because everyone has those hitting you every day. So those don't count. Uh, we also have community-based cohorts, which are uh, define the size of a community and the cutoffs for each, uh, the, as well as different ratios for contributors, stars, forks, and others that give indications of the actual shape of the communities that are interacting with your repositories. Content-based cohorts uh, also cover different things such as, do we use GitHub Actions? Uh, do we publish a package or binary artifact? Uh, the other one is, is there the words sample, demo, or example in the name or description that would actually indicate this is the intended use of this package? Um, these also simplify identification of different projects with different needs and different capabilities to respond with a certain best practice guidance when taken uh, as a collective. Uh, so now, uh, this one's still mine? Yeah, this one's still mine. Uh, now let's apply some of these groups and see what we can learn uh, through some sample repositories. Uh, we have two different repositories and a selection of co cohorts for which they fall into. By looking at just the cohort columns that are flagged, we can tell a lot about the repositories pretty quickly. Uh, TypeScript is a fairly old repo. It's developed by a large group of contributors. It's highly cloned. It has a significant number of non-Microsoft contributors. It was updated recently, and it uses CI-CD tooling in the form of GitHub Actions. Uh, in contrast, Azure OpenAI Docs sample repository is younger in age. It's a toy repository, meaning that uh, we take a ratio of this, the stars and likes, and we've determined that there's a small number of contributors versus engaged users. Uh, and it has zero non-Microsoft contributors and is declared by name as a sample. So by describing this repository with its identified cohorts, we can quickly gain insight into how a repository is being used by its community. It also is uh, important to note that our cohorts are true at the time they're calculated. So as a repo gets older, it will of course change the age cohort. As the community changes, if it grows or shrinks, it, will grow, it can go from a toy to a stadium or a federation back to a stadium, de depending on the activity. Uh, now that you've kind of seen a little bit of the high level stuff of how we at Microsoft are approaching it, I'm gonna hand it over to my CMS homies. Thank you, James. So, um, in our version of doing uh, repository cohort identification, uh, when we think about the value that an open source program office can bring, uh, we sort of have these categories of benefits on the left. And, you know, OSPOs are here to help us save money and time. They're here to help reduce duplicate costs and work. They're here to reduce security and continuity risks. We're here to be an engine for talent, as Natalia and Isaac are testament to, and also provide accountability for contractor performance. So from a high level, that's sort of how we see our role at the agency. And then going deeper into the pipeline itself, uh, we have uh, this suite of tools that have been developed over the last year or so. Uh, the first one starts with repository maturity models, and those help us answer the question of, where is your project in your open source journey? And then, once we've helped to determine that, we have another question we can answer with templates. So, um, yeah, it's a little hard to read, apologies. Uh, tell you what, I'm gonna walk over here. <laughs> So it's, you know, what files are required and recommended for good repository hygiene? And then once you have those templates to help people set that baseline, then we're having a checklist that they can go through to make sure that they adhere to the baseline. So what steps should a project take to release this repository publicly based on what your goals are and where you are in your maturity model? And then after that, um, or in conjunction with that, we have a command line tool called Cookie Cutter which is a Python library on the command line, help you walk through some steps. We're gonna have the rest of the team talk about that in a second, but that will help you sort of be like a sorting hat to figure out where you are in your journey. And then finally, uh, we have Repo Linter, which is a tool developed by the to-do group, uh, which basically lets us check whether or not a file exists and help us to figure out how to comply with 
these maturity models and make sure they're being followed. And if you want to hear more about that, I blew that pretty quick, but we're going to give a whole talk on it at the end of the day today here in this room, establishing a baseline with repo metrics, models, templates, and checklists. So 410, we'll be back in the room. And now I believe I'm passing it to Natalia, who will tell us more about some of these other tools. Okay, thanks Remy. So at CMS, one of the ways that we create repository cohorts is by classifying by maturity level. So we developed a maturity model framework where we have five, uh, five tiers of maturity levels. So I'm gonna go through each one. So the first one is our tier zero private repository tier. And uh, its purpose is that the project is sort of in an historical or experimental stage, usually an early prototype. And then from there, we have our tier one one-time release stage where the project is sort of, um, is sort of a implementation reference where we kind of just release the project for transparency or accountability purposes. But since it's a one-time release, there's no plan for future activity or maintenance for the project. After that, we have our tier two close collaboration tier with where the project uh, is working in a sort of inner style uh, type work. After that, we have our tier three working in public repository where um, this is a public project where we are open to limited external contributions. And this is an agency led project, either by choice or by statute, because sometimes we have legislation which requires us to lead the project. And finally, we have our tier four community governance project, where this is a community led project with an open governance structure. So given our five maturity model tiers, we provide tools to allow our project teams to identify which tier the repository is at. So first we ask a series of questions, which helps us determine the tier, such as does your repository have more than one contributor? Do you plan on cutting more than one release? Do you plan on having other individuals work with you? Do you plan on having other individuals and teams outside the agency maintain the project with you? Or do you have any individuals or outside teams develop the roadmap with you? And then using our cookie cutter command tool, it asks these series of questions and project teams will get a result that will tell them which tier their project is under. And I will pass it on to Isaac to talk about another way we classify our repositories. Thank you, Natalia. Another way that we use uh, repo cohorts here at CMS is uh, by using Nadia labels, which was mentioned earlier, but I elaborate on it now. Uh, in our book, Working in Public by Nadia Astrid-Rastronova, uh, she classifies repositories into four main cohorts. So, and, and these are determined by um, the taxonomy of their uh, contributor growth, high or low, or their user growth, high or low. And this sort of like tells you at a glance, like, um, sort sort of like, like the the uh, some of the the nature of the project in terms of like its contributors relative to its users. So if something's a club, you know that there's a lot of contributors on it, but not a lot of uh, user interest in that project. So it might be something that's uh, more interesting to developers, but not so much uh, uh, brimming with use cases. Um, Furthermore, into the like exact implementation of how we did it, we uh, um, implemented Microsoft's uh, implementation idea of how to map this to a specific uh, specific function. As you can see, we uh, take into account the ratio of stargazers to contributors, as well as the amount of unique contributors. Um, a key uh, tool that we use uh, and take advantage of upstream is Augur. Uh, Chaos's Augur project is uh, a, a metrics project that uh, makes an API available to, to people in order to track their repos and, and get key metrics and data about it. And, and, and uh, one of the a good feature about it is uh, the, um, the contributor resolution that it has. And we're able to take care, uh, we're able to take advantage of that in order to really uh, uh, implement repo cohorts in the federal government and, and sort of like contribute upstream to something that people can use in, in other places. Um, and uh, this exact implementation actually adds another category called contributor mid. This is to avoid like trying to force uh, all projects into sp these specific categories and you know tr try to uh, only apply it when it's uh, necessary and descriptive. Okay, so to recap the pipeline. So it starts off uh, with hacking upstream. 
right? The Augur project and the chaos community are a fantastic place where OSPOs can get support in learning about metrics and activity and just keeping track of uh, your communities and how they're growing. Um, Augur is the place that ingests the public repository data from GitHub. And then uh, it processes that metadata and puts it into an API endpoint that we can hit. Um, and then once that is in an API call, uh, we can actually pass that into our metrics front end, which we're gonna talk about in just a moment. And we can generate these nifty little badges that are color coded and easy to put on your repositories uh, using the shields.io API. So um, there's two different sets of APIs. There's three different sets of communities. Um, this is an excellent example of sort of bringing together public sector, private sector, and academia all under one roof to solve a problem for everybody in the upstream. Yeah, going further into how we uh, basically communicate these standards and practices of cohorts to people and our stakeholders and clients, what well, we take advantage of RepoLinter, which is a tool maintained by to-do group for checking repositories for common open source issues using predefined rule sets. Uh, it can be run standalone as a script, a pre-commit or post-commit with CI, CI, and CD systems. Uh, we uh, um, use a GitHub action to, to run, uh, run ours in some of our repositories. Um, thank you to Chan and Sotwick at the Comcast OSPO uh, for contributing uh, our repo linter.json rules in a way that's uh, very advanced and immature. Not only are we checking for you know the uh, presence of these files, we're also checking for subcategories within them. Uh, I, I know you're sick of hearing about the XE vulnerability, but one of the things that was intertwined with that was they changed the uh, contact address of the security at MD. So something like this could detect that and you know uh, raise the alarm bells, if, if you will. Um, and yeah, here, here's an example of the, of the output. Uh, we mentioned our metrics uh, uh, front end before. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of what it looks like in action. Uh, see, uh, we have uh, our CMS uh, GitHub organizations being tracked here, as you can see. Um, and you can uh, go to the website yourself in order to, to look at all, all of our wonderful open source projects. Um, you can see that we've uh, taken advantage of the Nadia labels. So you can see this beneficiary fire data is a club. So it has a lot of contributors, but not necessarily a lot of user growth. And that, that tells you a lot about like the nature of the project and its status and its maturity and sort of like where it is in, in its attempt to get out the door. Um. Oh, it's me. Uh, all right, so at Microsoft, we haven't done a beautiful UI. Uh, we're a little bit more da back-end data-driven. Uh, so for us, uh, the way that we approach it uh, is different, which is something to keep in mind with these. Uh, every time a uh, new organization wants to implement these, these cohorts, uh, it, they're going to be restricted by their own internal organization, uh, their, their organization skills, and what in engineering systems are available. So this is a clear representation of we're just doing things a little bit differently. Uh, so the way that Microsoft approaches co cohorts is that uh, we are fortunate enough to have a central team to actually collect all of the metadata for our repositories. Uh, it, they then store that uh, in a Kubernetes cluster, or it gets aggregated by a Kubernetes cluster, and then it gets stored into a Kusto uh, query, query cluster that we run internally. Uh, we as the OSPO then share a set of uh, standardized Kusto query language queries that calculates uh, the dozens of cohorts that we use uh, for each repository. And then the raw repository metadata columns and calculated repository cohort columns are stored in the same table. Uh, and then we use those to then build or enhance da other data-driven projects for us. Uh, so some examples of our usage of cohorts at, at Microsoft. Uh, we use them to understand the distribution of different repository types and use cases across our large org organizations. Uh, this has been great at providing hard data for the number of projects that use uh, a repository in a specific way that is different than the median repository that we might expect across all of our organizations. Uh, we also I use them to identify repositories for in-depth interviews and manual investigation as needed. So for example, if we're looking for some specific uh, cohort trait across our group of repositories and 25% of them look like stadium repositories while 75% of them look like toys, we can then design our questions or policies to make sure that we don't miss too much of either one and don't favor one over the other. Uh, this results in precisely targeted requirements and policies, uh, and they, which means that we have a smaller blast radius if and when something goes wrong. Uh, they also help us in designing compliance measurements effectively. 
So if there's a rule set that, that only applies to a subset of cohorts, we can hold them uh, to those requirements without negatively impacting other cohorts. So for example, if a cohort is filled with repositories that are actively being developed well uh, at 15% and 85% of the repos are actually sitting there dormant, not being updated or, or uh, having any activity in the last six months, uh, we can then understand, uh, and understand this and change the way that we actually approach our policy. Um, Understanding this can mean that uh, our cohorts actually dictate a better course of action uh, for our company. Uh, so I said earlier we're not going to go into the demos. That's still true, but I want to talk about the demos quickly so you understand what they're doing. Uh, so there's two live demos. Uh, you can see a minimal version of repository cohorts in action, and we hope that this will help solidify your understanding of the concept. Uh, the first demo is a GitHub uh, pages site that is a uh, fixed report or fixed export of raw repository metadata from Microsoft owned repositories. It has about 10,000 repositories worth of data within it. Uh, and it calculates the repositor co repository cohorts that we use with the uh, linked JavaScript at the bottom there. Uh, you'll be getting that one again at the end as well. Uh, repository cohorts are then visualized via tables and bar charts with some slider UIs to investigate different subsets of Microsoft repositories and is a great way to start learning about our cohorts and how we define them. Uh, the second demo is one that you're probably all a little bit more interested in. Uh, this allows you to put your organization name in, in the box and then it starts uh, crunching numbers for you so you can start seeing what kind of uh, information you get with laying, layering our cohort information onto your repositories. Um, this calls the Ecosystems API uh, for repository data, and so it's important to remember that these might not have every uh, available repository in the system. Uh, it may also be lacking committer information for some rep repositories, but despite these limitations, it's still a great resource for this demo, uh, and it gets the repository metadata quickly enough that you can calculate repository cohorts uh, quickly and easily without any uh, additional work on your end. Uh, so another cool thing about it is uh, since we're providing you the demo code, you can actually uh, augment it so you can put it into whatever storage mechanism you're using and then actually run more in-depth queries against them you know, as you see fit. Uh, both demos share the same code. Uh, importantly, uh, how to create each cohort is defined as a JSON data structure where each object in an array defines a structure to be called and that uh, the arguments to be given to that function, including thresholds for what is in and out of a specific cohort. Uh, this makes it very easy to add new cohorts or share definition, definitions of cohorts with other interested parties or organizations. Um, if you have a cohort you found useful, please consider submitting a pull request. Uh, even though this is just a demo and it's not particularly going to be something you want to make production ready, we're still using it and we want to learn as much as we can from application of this on a larger scale. Uh, because like all things open source, we can always achieve more together. Uh, so to conclude. Uh, repository cohorts are a concept that can help OSPOs go beyond one-size-fits-all policy and start treating repositories according to some explicitly defined characteristics through metadata. Uh, repository cohorts lower the time and cognitive barrier to using repository metadata routinely and with repeatable restrictions. And while there are many ways to collect raw metadata, as has been shown in this presentation, the general concept is demonstrated to be reusable by being individually created and used by two different organizations giving this talk. So, as promised, Here's those links again. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to take another photo. Uh, and then at the bottom, that's the, the direct link to the cohort definitions that we're using in the demos. Um, with that, we're going to open up to any questions. Uh, and here's the dog tax paid in full. So the floor is yours. Okay. And um, just oh, to add sorry. a little bit. Oh, there was a, I skipped over. I'm so no sorry. No worries. No worries at all. OK, I just wanted to highlight one more conclusion that um, we already have other organizations and experts that have already have done work in this area. So shout out to Chaos Community and to Do Group and others. So, and they have developed standard, open standards that create a shared understanding across projects, organizations, and communities. So you be sure to apply their work into what you're doing. Okay, and that's all. We'll open it up for Q&A. Oh, also those are the email addresses uh, for contacting these lovely folks at CMS, as well as my team at uh, the OSPO at Microsoft. So. You for you, Eric first. We'll go with Eric first, and then we'll go to you.
Correct. Have you looked at using the um, repository properties in that data? We have. Uh, so specifically at Microsoft, we got very interested and excited about them, uh, but we realized quickly that those properties are also publicly available. So some of the information we would want to store in them was not something we would particularly want to share. Uh, that being said, uh, it is something that's on the roadmap uh, once we can get around that. So. And, and just a quick follow-up, is that you mentioned that some of them are, uh, uh, they change over time mm -hmm. within Project DW, and then you can increase them. So I'm not really as surprised as what you just said earlier, so I just wanted to... That's how I know it is. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's one of the reasons why we use Kusto. Uh, so we can have every entry is a new entry. And so we have historical data just by default. Um, but it'd be very easy to augment that to have every time you run the cohort translations to actually store, store it as a, a tombstone. Uh, but I believe CMS has something. Yes. Uh, actually, in our, hold on, let me go to the right slide. I just skipped through all of it. Um, yeah, in our, uh, basically our front end for our metrics, uh, it, it's generated from our metrics repo, and we store all of the data as JSON in the GitHub. So you can just go through the GitHub history and see all the history of everything ever. So. All right, thank you so much. Uh, you, what was your question? I got it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the I I very highly went over them. Uh, I went over them at a high level, but yeah, you could you could augment those to be whatever labels you want. We've just found that the Nadia labels actually were the most conducive to the kinds of problems we were trying to solve. Um, uh, not yet. We're working on it. We're working on it. So right now, it was the scramble to get the demo up so we could we could start sharing that. But we're 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 hoping to get there eventually. Of course. We have an open endpoint in Augur, but yes, we do need to work on documentation. Okay. Any additional questions? So it sounds like you can actually have an intent to do it from um, this point in time or something like that. Can you use this point in time to do it from the um, much earlier point that you're talking about where you have all your bugs and things like that up to this point? Like, Uh, so, no, go ahead, Remy. I want you to answer. Yeah, so the question was, is um, it seems like there's some intent with the maturity models, and have we seen projects that sort of started out with a certain intention and then ended up somewhere else? So the answer is yes, of course. Um, I think that part of the reason why we do a maturity model with different levels is so that there is more of a, a clear step or a ladder for getting between each of those levels. So once we have more granular repository metadata, we can say things like, yes, you have a contributing.md, but you don't talk about your branching model, and you don't talk about where patches go, and you don't talk about how to become a maintainer of the project. If you add these sections, then that could help you grow from being you know, this size of a community to that size of a community. And we can start to provide granular guidance, and we can point to different standards and projects um, in government, uh, I've been in other OSPOs. This is my first time around in the public sector. It is a very specific kind of ecosystem. So a lot of our projects are uh, contractor driven or internally driven. So uh, there's much less emphasis on things like new contributors or drive-by patches. Um, and there's a lot more interest in things like, you know, SLAs for time to response and, you know, accountability for performance. So you know, we want to cover all of those bases, and that's why we have the five different tiers. But thanks to, you know, the work of uh, Satwick over at the Comcast OSPO, and we've got that granular repo linter config now that can help us dial in even deeper and give that kind of guidance to go between the levels. And that's actually exactly what spawned us pursuing it at Microsoft is we were seeing projects getting to a threshold that were 
ostensibly supposed to be samples that had picked up had picked up traction. And so we wanted to figure out a way, how can we actually, one, identify them quickly and easily, and then two, what are the things that we can start building policy or, or workflows that they're supposed to follow to, you know, meet the requirements that security puts on them, uh, and then, uh, you know, make sure that we're not also stifling their, their progress in other areas. So being able to just properly understand what, what we currently have and where things are going give, gives us the ability to, you know, ensure that we're not getting in their way and we're ensuring that we're staying secure and our end users are safe. Of course. Any more? Another special consideration of being in the government is that this is the people's code, right? Like it's taxpayer funded, it belongs to the people. So there's an extra transparency and historical information function that comes from releasing the code because it's probably foiable anyway. So why not make it easy and accessible for people to use and find? So that extra goal and being explicit and saying like, you know, in our maturity model, we talk about like, if you're going to be a one-time release, do not give an expectation that you're going to be accepting contributors and pull requests because it's more frustrating for people to submit their time and their effort to a project where it's not able to be received. So communicating those expectations clearly. And we know that not every project wants to be an open governance, you know, federation or uh, stadium project. So making those spaces for those projects lets us figure out how best to allocate our very limited resources. We're a small team. You're looking at almost all of us. There's one more, shout out Aya Ali, who helped us to build out all these slide decks and is an amazing product person on our team. But that going forward, um, making sure that those different levels are there for those different kinds of projects lets us invest our resources judiciously. Yeah, I got nothing to add to that. That was great. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. I hope this was useful for you uh, and enjoy the rest of your con.